Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so glad to see you. Um, today is Good Friday. And it's kind of like a, a uh, contradiction in terms when you think about it. Uh, it's good for us, but Jesus died on the cross. So during our practice this morning, uh, we were talking about the aspect of that we want to celebrate Sunday morning, and Sunday is coming. And I'm excited for that. I sure got an amen on that. Sunday is coming. But we have to, and I want to focus this morning on, we have to realize we have to go through Friday first. And today is a day that we remember Jesus dying on the cross. And it's okay to have a, a somewhat of a heavy heart. As a believer, we sit there and think, okay, we shouldn't have a heavy heart on this day because, you know, we, we know, looking back, that Jesus rose from the dead. We know that. We have the, the fortune to be able to see that. Back then, they did. When Jesus went to the cross, they didn't know what was going to happen. And they mourned his death. And it's okay because it was for our sin that he died. We caused this on him. We're the ones, the guilty ones, uh, that were able to go free because of his sacrifice. So today, I just, this may be odd to you, a little strange to you, but let us take just a moment in this morning just to remember that it cost heaven everything for us to be able to be here today. It cost heaven everything for us to be forgiven and to to have our sins forgiven, to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, and to be able to go to heaven. So that's what today is. So if your heart's a little heavy, it's okay for that to be today. But also understand, Sunday is coming. Sunday is coming. So if we're going to be having communion at the end of the service, at the end of the message, so if you haven't picked yours up yet, uh, they're sitting right there at the back two tables there. So I want to encourage you, you know, anytime during the service, go and grab them. And, uh, you know, I know they're a little difficult to open, but, you know, just, you, you'll get better as, as, it gets, as we get used to them. And so I, I'm going to invite you to stand and to join us today as we just worship him and give him praise. Let's stand and let's sing this song. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So love he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Oh, perfect redemption, oh, purchase of blood. The promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus the pardon receive. And praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father. Through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Great things he has taught us, great things he has done, and greater rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be. Our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the
the glory. Great things. Sing it again to Him today. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory. Great things He has done. So, Father, we just thank You. We thank you, Lord, that we are able to be here today. And Father, remember what Jesus has done for us. He came to die for our sins. Father, what amazing grace it was. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sing this with us. Oh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught. My heart to fear and grace my fears will How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed through many toils through many again when we've been there 10,000. When we Thank you, we thank you, we thank you. Amazing grace, Lord. Hallelujah. The Bible in Isaiah chapter 53 says these words. And these were words that were prophesied many, many, many years before Jesus even arrived on the scene. Verse 1 says, Who has believed our message? And to whom is the arm of the Lord being revealed? 
He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root of the dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hid their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. Are you understanding that? He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, and the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds. I like this part. We are healed. We are like all sheep have gone astray, each one of us turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, and yet he did not, did not, did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears, he was silent. He did not open his mouth. That's what Jesus did for you and I. It was on that cross he gave of himself. Just take a moment and just reflect upon that. Cherish the old rugged cross until my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross. Exchanges someday for a crown on the hill, on a hill far away, stood a low rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame, and I love. That old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish, so I'll cherish the old rocky cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will claim. will claim to the old rocket cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, that old rocket cross. Oh, the old rocket cross so despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God, for the dear Lamb of God, let this glory above to pirate, to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old That last I lay down. Oh, I will, I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange. 
Lord, we get so caught up in what we think church should be. We get so caught up in everything we forget what it really is about. It's not about the music. It's not about the lights or, or anything else. But, Father, it's about us having a heart of worship to bring you more than just our, our song today. Because, God, you search deeper than our hearts. Hallelujah. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come Longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. Sing that again. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come Longing just to bring something that's of worth 
that will bless your heart. I'll bring it to you today, Lord. I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. King of Endless Ones. Let's sing it to him. King of endless words, no one could express how much you deserve. The one weak, the one weak and poor, all I have is yours. Every single breath, let's bring it to him now. I'll bring you now. I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. Oh, you search, Lord. You search much deeper within. Through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you, it's all about you, Lord. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. And it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you. Oh, and it's all about you. It's all about you. Oh, it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, Father, it is all about you. It's not about us. It's not about what we think. It's about you. So, Father, we just give ourselves a fresh today to you right here, right now. Father, as the psalmist David says, our hearts are prone to wander. Lord, we get so turned around so many times, so many ways. We need your Holy Spirit to keep us. Father, as we take a few moments to look into your word, we're asking you to help us to understand what you would say to us today. Give us a heart of worship, a heart that would hear and listen to you. Father, we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.
and amen. Thank you, worship team. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. I am so glad you are here with us today. Uh, you look good. You look good. Amen. Just want to encourage you, don't forget, Sunday is coming. But today, I just want us just to focus for a few moments uh, on <clears throat> what today represents. As followers in, in Jesus, we need to remember, need to embrace Good Friday. At the end of the message, we're going to do communion and the whole concept behind communion, he, Jesus tells his disciples, he says, do this in remembrance of me. So we're to remember him. Which, when we look at embracing Good Friday, which is a, a little bite like saying we need to remember torture or sorrow or pain. This morning I want us to take a few moments to discover the four powerful reflections on the cross for you this Good Friday. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 25, whether you have it. Uh, the, remember the old-fashioned Bible we used to have, paper? I still have some of those. <laughs> whether electronic device, a, a regular Bible, whatever it is. But follow with me on Matthew chapter 16. Verse 21 says this. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things by the, at the hands of the elder, elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and then on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned to Peter and, and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have the mind, in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. Father, bless the reading of your word today. May it impact our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're taking notes, it'll be on the screen behind you or online. I want to welcome those who are joining us online as well. I don't know if there's anybody in the parking lot. We still broadcast into the parking lot. But if you're taking notes, write this down, four points. First one is, Friday is the road to Sunday. Good Friday is a day that we remember the crucifixion of Jesus, but there's, there's more to it than that, uh, to remembering. And, and my task as a preacher is to call people to the cross. The cross is the pivotal point of history for all of humanity. Your task as a believer is to do the same. Did you know that? Your task is to call people to the cross, to, to tell people what he did for them. To tell how he died for the whole world and that, that no one, absolutely no one needs to be left out. You need to understand that. If you're watching us online and you do not know Jesus, you do not need to be left out. Jesus died for you, died for me. And we need to understand that. We need to grab a hold of that reality. I know some of you might be thinking, even some watching online thinking, but do you know what I, I've done? I probably don't. But Jesus does. God does. And he loves you anyway. There's nothing you have done that can cause him to not want you. I remember many years ago as a young preacher in my late teens, or just starting out, 
I, I got thrown into preaching. I mean, I got thrown in this right into the deep end. If you ask me when I was 16, 17 years old, if I'd be a preacher, I'd look and say, say what? I'm, when God called me into the ministry, when I gave my heart to the Lord, I was about, I, I was just 17, uh, just turned 17, and uh, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. I didn't even know what it was. said, I want you to be a pastor. My mother would say, you know, when you come to know the Lord, he has a job for you. He has a plan for your life. And I'm like, that sounds great. Then he says, I, I remember sitting in our kitchen, at our kitchen table on 13 Grafton Avenue in Hamilton, Ontario. It was a Friday night, and I rededicated my life to the Lord. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. I didn't even know who the Holy Spirit was. He says, I want you to be a pastor. I didn't even know what a pastor was. You've got to understand, I was shy, was shy. And when I went to church and found what a pastor was, I said, God, are you off your rocker? But slowly but surely, I started giving into what the Holy Spirit. I fought him for a good year, year and a half. But in my late teens, we were going to the prison detention center with a group of others to hold church services. And I was asked to preach the following Sunday. Now, we had busy Sundays that time. So this is how our typical Sunday went uh, when I was a, in my late teens. We would arrive at the Hamilton Wentworth Detention Center by 8.30 in the morning walk through various uh, security checkpoints, maximum security, held multiple services for the inmates because they were uh, what they call protective custody, high-end criminals. They couldn't be together. Some could, some couldn't. Uh, then I played the piano for our church, our home church. I had to be at the church by 1030. We had practice on Thursday nights and go over the last-minute things with a band leader. His name was Robert Hollingsworth. Fantastic, big, big man. After the morning service was finished, we drove several people home from church who had no ride. Then we grabbed a quick bite to eat, and we had to go to a nursing home for 2 o'clock every Sunday. This was our schedule every Sunday after, uh, for another service. And after that service, we'd go back to the church, pick up some sound equipment, and go to an outdoor evangelistic service in the park downtown Hamilton at King and James. You remember that park. We still attended Sunday evening services in which I played as well. Those were busy days. Understand, we also worked all night Saturday night and had to finish what we didn't get done Saturday night on Sunday night. Say all that to say this, that we were committed to our faith and to the church and to the ministry was something that was important to us. But you have to understand this. No matter how important, how committed we can be, there was no one that was more important, uh, committed to the importance of the ministry than Jesus himself. He gave it all, and, and I find it, Sometimes we treat his efforts like something that's not really important. This day we commemorate the, his death, his sacrifice, him laying it all down for you and for I. I but I digress from the, the original aspect of the message. Let me get back to the prison story. I'm asked to preach, not knowing what to preach about. See, you got to understand, I just recently acknowledged the fact that one day I might become a preacher. And I agreed without thinking about it to preach that following Sunday. I had no idea what to preach. I didn't have years of experience and, or the knowledge of thousands of books or my, at that time my college education to draw from. I had none of that to draw from. Stanley Whitaker, he has gone on to be with the Lord. He was a great in, uh, missionary to India. Uh, he took us under his wing. He was one of our mentors. Uh, he could preach like, I, I mean, he could preach a drop of the hat. He was one of the board members of the church, and he took us under his wing. He couldn't sing to save his life. And when I was learning how to play the organ, remember those things? Way back in the day. <laughs> Started off with the drums. And my family were thrilled with that. I had my bedroom had a bed, a stereo system with speakers this high that I built, and the drum set. That was my bedroom. Uh, but when I learned how to play organ, we'd go to the nursing homes in this outdoor park, and he would lead the songs. And Stanley Wither, fantastic man, he could sing Amazing Grace in the key of F, G, D, A, and B flat all at the same time. And like, oh, 
So it got to the point, our running little commentary was that, okay, Brother Stanley, I'll give you the key to start. Don't start anything until you hear the note from me first. Took several months for him to get that, but he finally did. But what a mentor. I remember when I had to preach, I said, I, I have no idea what to preach on. He told me these words I've never forgotten because sometimes we get off topic. We get sidetracked with you no know, social concerns that are happening in the world around us. And he said to me, he said, preach Christ and preach Christ crucified. You can't go wrong with that. So that's what I did. See, it's all about him. Being crucified for us. We, we want to embrace the resurrection, but Jesus calls us to the cross too. The famous sermon that says it's, fr it's Friday, but Sunday's coming more properly points to, to uh, the point of the story is that Friday is the road to Sunday. You cannot arrive on Sunday without going through Friday. There is no Easter Sunday morning, no resurrection Sunday morning without Good Friday. There is no resurrection without a death. There is no resurrection without the cross. And our job is to tell people the truth. There's Good Friday for all of us. Jesus came to die on the cross for our sins. It doesn't matter how low in the world we have sunken down into the pit of despair and of sin, Jesus came to die for us. It doesn't matter what you have done, Jesus died for you. That blows me away. And I've been doing this now since I've been preaching as a full-time pastor since 1990. <laughs> I started preaching. I was turning 18 when I was preaching. I'm 58 years old now. I'm going to be 59 this year. Oh. Who said that? Okay, can we get some mushrooms? Get these people out? No, just kidding. We're going to skip. No, just kidding. And even after all these years... It still blows my mind that Jesus would come to die for me. And I'm thinking, do you know what I've done, Jesus? And the reality of it is he does. Friday is the road to Sunday. Number two, everyone has a problem with the cross. The very idea of Good Friday causes a concern. The problem is that both his power and his wisdom led them to the cross. A brutal denial of everything he had done before. Those who had seen his power wondered why he seemed so powerless now at his greatest need. Notice I use the word seemed because he wasn't. Understand this truth. Jesus was not martyred. They didn't kill him. You think, isn't that what Good Friday is all about? Yes, he died. But remember the words of Jesus when he says, no one takes his life, but he lays his life down willingly. He laid his life down willingly. Even while we were shaking our fists at God, saying, I want nothing to do with you. God, prove yourself to me. God, I don't believe you're real. He still died for us, laid his life down for us in spite of our sin. They had a hard time with the cross. And he wondered why someone with his intelligence would allow himself to be put into that situation. Both sides miss what Jesus and the Father were saying. John 12, 24 says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, say dies, it abides alone, but if it dies, it produces many. Not just his words, his very life is that parallel and that parable of that. It wasn't just the people of Jesus a day who had a problem with the cross. The people I speak to week after week after week have a problem with the cross. Religious-minded people want miracles. They want power.
power. They want to see some intellectual people, minded people, want wisdom and truth. And, and they sit there and say, show me a miracle. What God offers us all is first the cross. Before you can go anywhere, you have to see the cross. The early, earliest believers called the cross the wisdom of God and the power of God. This is a stumbling block for us to consider today that both his power and his wisdom led him to the cross. We have a hard time computing that. People prefer not to dwell on such things. After all, who respects suffering? Suffering shows a sign of weakness. When was the last time you spoke to people about suffering? You need to understand this. At any moment, Jesus could have called 10,000 legions of angels. All you would have to do is utter the one word, and they would have come and rescued him from that scene. It wasn't the Roman soldiers and the, the centurion guards or, or the nails or, or the, the crowd that held him on that cross. The only thing that held him on that cross was his love for you and I. That is the only thing that held him to that cross. But we, we, we look at this. It, it, I have people telling me all the time, I will believe in God if he showed me a miracle. And I'm thinking, no, you won't. See, God isn't some puppet on a string that we can say, dance, little puppet, dance. Show me a miracle. Let's grab a little genie bottle and let's rub it and say, God, I have three wishes. I want you to show me a miracle. God doesn't work that way. I see people on Facebook all the time thinking, with, if you say amen to this, you're, you'll get money. You'll be blessed. Someone will give you money by the end of this week if you say amen or share this post. God's not a genie in the, in, in the bottle. He's not a puppet on a string. We can't say, okay, God, dance. Dance, little puppet. God doesn't want, he is God, and you either believe him or you don't. Bottom line. I love how the, the, the book of Genesis opens up in the very beginning. In the beginning, God. My wife and I, I, I took a course in Bible college on apologetics. Anybody not know what apologetics is? No, it's not the course that Canadians take because they have to they apologize, say I'm sorry all the time. Not that kind of apologetics. I had to put that in there. Apologetics is 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 the is is how to st- study and to defend your faith from a biblical theological point of view and a scientific point of view. I took a couple courses on that. Uh, my wife and I just reordered a, 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 a series to go through it again. It's, it's awesome. But one of the things I find out that God doesn't sit there and have a course on the apologetics when it says, in the beginning, God. And then it starts explaining. It says, in the beginning, God. Boom. Done. If they had PA system, the mic, microphone then, God would have done the mic drop. You either believe him or not. I choose to believe him, and you can choose not to at your choice, but do it at your own peril. But the truth still remains. People then and people now do not understand the cross. They want a story worth telling, and the cross just isn't that. Number three, Friday means the beginning of change. Good Friday provides the opportunity to proclaim. Once you've been to the cross, everything changes. If you knew who I was before I became a believer, <clears throat> I, I get a kick I, several years back. I've ever, ever met, meet up with some of your the people you went to school with? Anybody? Well, <laughs> I was an interesting young man growing up. This, we'll leave that there. And I remember seeing some people, and they would, I remember the one guy, his name was Alan, and I met him at the, uh, was it the A&P? They had an A&P store in Hamilton. at Centennial Parkway and Barton Street there. 
he saw me, and him and I never got along at all. I was a very angry young man. Like, I would get into fights every single day. It wasn't a good day unless I had a good fight. That's how I grew up. I remember seeing him there, and I'm walking out, and by this time, I'm saved. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm speaking in tongues, and, and I've accepted the call of God upon my life, so I'm going to be a preacher. And meet Alan. He sees me, and by this time, I'm a lot taller than he is now. He would bully me and pick on me because I was always small. But this time, I'm like six foot tall now. I see him, I say, I yell, Alan! He sees me. Remember those conveyor belts they had in some of the stores where they put the big basket down? You get curbside pickup in the grocery store. Do you remember those? I, I, they, they slide down like this. So I see him. I, I wanted to say hi to my friend. Because now I'm not angry with him because I've got Jesus in my heart. And I wanted his love on everybody. So I see him. He literally throws himself on top of the cart. It's going this way. He's running the other way, running out the store. So here I'm thinking, why doesn't he want to talk to me? So I run after him. I'm yelling. I said, said, I'm not going to fight you. I said, I've got Jesus. I never saw a person get into the car so fast and take off so fast in my entire life. I just imagine what the, if they had videotaping that. So the guy went, I've got Jesus. Don't run away. I, got, I won't hurt you. See, at the cross, everything changes. I used to have a very foul mouth. I mean, I got... I had my own chair at the principal's office when I was in school. It was nothing for my parents to get a phone call from the school that I was in some type of trouble again. But once I came to know Jesus, and then when the older you get, this gets more and more. Once you've been to the cross, everything changes. Stumbling blocks and foolishness turned into power and wisdom. The cross changes everything. If, someone's, if, something pursue, if something's pursuing you, then perhaps the event that will change everything for you is the cross. If nothing is changing you, maybe you haven't been to the cross. Easter is indeed about the empty tomb. I understand it. But first, it's about the cross. We're in such a hurry to rush to Sunday morning. We're so hurried to get Jesus raised up and back to heaven and, and the Holy Spirit and all that stuff. And all that stuff's important. But it's because the cross doesn't fit our picture of how things ought to be. It didn't fit in with the people back then either. It was the road for Jesus. And understand this, the road to the cross is the road for us as well. Fourth and finally. Jesus demonstrated faith over circumstances. Can we be honest? Can we say that God never promises to forsake you? But it always doesn't feel that way, does it? Here are two phrases Jesus uttered on the cross. Why have you forsaken me? Let that just sink in for a moment. Why, God, why, Father, have you forsaken me? And the other one, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. How can these two go together? Even, even in uh, his death, Jesus showed us how to trust the Father beyond his own circumstances. Jesus predicted his death and his resurrection. It's one thing to predict the future. It's quite another thing to go to the cross willingly. Jesus knew what the cross was holding for him. At least three times, Jesus shared his destiny with the disciples. And they didn't understand it. And more challenging still is the fact that Jesus embraced this destiny by faith. He knew the, the Father's promise of the resurrection, but, but death still lay ahead of him. He could not be raised from the dead if he did not die on the cross. And death was still death even for Jesus. Because understand that this is a sermon all in itself. Jesus was, had two natures, the divine nature and the human nature. He was every bit God. He was every bit man. And death is still death. Even for Jesus. 
It was his trust in the Father's promise that caused him to wager everything he had, even his very life, for us. As a man, Jesus showed us and modeled for us how to trust the Father. How about you this morning? Do you trust him? Those of us, those of you watching us online, are you trusting him? Do you know him as your personal Lord and Savior? What I like to do before we go into communion, I like to close us off in a word of prayer. And this is an opportunity that if you're not right with God, If you're not right with God, if you're not where you should be with God, this is a moment you can be. Since I gave my heart to the Lord, it was just shortly after I was 17 years old. It was in January. I lived, I, I went up and down. I, I had ups and downs in my Christian walk. It is like everyone else, but God has always been so faithful. But I made a commitment to him some 40 years ago and I, will on, I have to honestly tell you, I have not regretted a single moment of it. He has proven himself to be faithful to me time and time again. And get a load of this, even when I'm not. Even when I blow it, even when I, I, I mess up so badly, I don't, even think, I don't even think God can fix my problem, but he always does. He's always there. So I've been in this a long time. I only have one regret in my life, and I've said this before, I'll say it again. The only regret I have in my life that I did not come to know Jesus earlier than when I was 17. I wish I could be like some of these kids that, that have, are growing up in the church and go to Sunday school. I never went to Sunday school. The first time I attended church, I found out what a pastor was. I'm like, I ain't going to be one of those weird guys up the platform waving their hands, talking, preaching that. I ain't going to be one of those weirdos. These kids have an awesome opportunity to grow up in the faith. And maybe you're here today and you're not right with God. Maybe you're watching online. It's so simple. By recognizing that you've sinned, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 5, verse 8, I think, says that, uh, 6, verse 8 says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 says that if you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. That's how simple it is. So I want to invite you, I want you to join me in this prayer. Could we bow our heads and close our eyes? If you're watching, by, watching us online, you can say this same prayer in, in your home, in your car, in your truck, wherever you find yourself. You can say this same prayer, and they're just words. But today, they can be words that can change your life. And this is the prayer of Father God in heaven. I thank you for the cross. I recognize today that I am a sinner and I have sinned before you, O oh God. I ask you, Lord, to forgive me of my sin and to come into my heart, to come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. I confess, Jesus, that you are Lord I confess and I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. And I now call you my Lord. In Jesus' name I pray this prayer. Amen and amen. Father, for anyone that might have said that prayer, I ask you, Father, to help them, to guide them, to seal this promise with the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you said that prayer, whether you're here in the audience or online, or even in one of our parking lots, could you do us a favor and just fill out the connection card? Let us know. We'd love to know of that. If you need prayer, uh, please don't hesitate to um, get hold of us. 
Uh, we are embarking on our 24-hour week of prayer starting uh, the Easter Sunday was starting, Siobhan. Easter Sunday at 1 p.m., is it? At 1 p.m., some of you have signed up. If you haven't, uh, please do so. Uh, I know it's going to be, I'm really, ex I'm getting excited because I'm thinking things, awesome things are going to happen. But we're here to remember what Jesus did. Good Friday. The cross has to come before the resurrection. Jesus in the Bible says to us that Paul says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, he says, I did give to you what was delivered to me that Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it, and he gave thanks. And he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper saying, this is the new covenant of my blood. As often as you drink this cup, you will remember my death until I come. That's what we're doing this morning. This is what this entire day is all about. And throughout this day, when you leave, go to this place. Uh, can you do me a favor? I don't mean go around wearing sackcloth and ashes. That's not what it's about. But if I can encourage you throughout the day, just throughout the day, multiple times throughout the day. I made it a habit over the past several years to do this. I'll just pause whatever I'm doing and say, Lord, thank you for the cross. Thank you that I, I'm saved because of the cross. Thank you. And I'll just thank him throughout the day. Could you do that? Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread. He broke it, gave thanks. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. As often as you eat this bread, you will proclaim, you remember my death until I come. Let us partake together. In the same manner after the cup, after supper, he said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, the shedding of my blood. As often as you drink this cup, you will remember my death until I come. So let's remember his death. Let's remember his suffering today for what he's done for us. Let's partake together. Could we stand as we close in prayer today? Could I invite you as well? Just to maybe lift a hand, even one hand. Just Let's just take the next few moments just to thank him. We thank you, Father. We thank you that Jesus came and, and came to this world. He came to die for us. Even while we were sinners, you, you demonstrated your love towards us. We, we, didn't, we, we didn't then, we don't now. We don't deserve your love. We don't deserve it. And Father, like David says, our hearts are prone to wander. We're so, sometimes we get so confused. We get so mixed up. We don't know whether we're coming or whether we're going. And, and God, we're like sheep. We get, we get lost. We get so lost. But you're the shepherd that comes and searches for us time and time again. I think of that song, there's no mountain you won't climb, no wall you won't break down to come to rescue us in reckless love for us. So, Father, we thank you for this day. We, we rejoice in the aspect that it is because of this day that we commemorate your death. <laughs> we can look Back to look forward to know that Sunday is coming. And you did rise from the dead. Death couldn't hold you. You rose again. And Lord, we know that we also will rise. 
But Father, let us just take this moment and just remember and let us thank you because you paid the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. The epitome of holiness and perfection. The sinless, spotless, beautiful Lamb of God became a sin offering for us who defied your law, who, de- who defies your, your, your love and defies everything about you, yet you poured out your love to us. Amazing grace. We don't deserve it. Let us never forget this. Now, Lord, we go our separate ways and we have family events and Father, when we come back again on Sunday to celebrate the greatest day in history, the resurrection of our Savior and our Lord. Father, let us spend time with our families. Be with us. Give us traveling mercies. And we will be careful to give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.